Music Rules. It's the podcast where we talk about music that rules and rules that music. <laughs> <laughs> that is such that's a good my, tagline. That's my tagline. Uh, All right, your tagline. Yeah, really, it's a, uh, so it's a podcast for eclectic music lovers who uh, love deep dives into great music, such as the music we'll be talking about today. Um, I it. am one of your hosts. My name is Fen. I make music under the name Fen is Cool. Um, and my name is Jack, and I make music under Basil's Kite, mostly. mostly. And Okie Doke and Wollongong, all of these different projects. Ah, Check them out. Bam. Many things. Many things. Um, we also both have backgrounds in music uh, in terms of like we both studied it at university. Our day job is music. I'm a music tutor. Jack is a music therapist. Um, yes. So it's all, you know, it's music 24 7. Yeah, it is. It is. And, and you know what? I, uh, I sort of, I wanted to mention this on the previous episode, but I think despite having music 24 seven, sometimes I find that, uh, I don't do the same mindful listening I once used to do. So I'm hoping that we can, uh, we can inspire the listener and also maybe inspire ourselves with this pod to, you know, listen a bit more mindfully than we usually the do. The album we'll be talking about today is a 2016 release. Uh, from an Australian artist actually named Katie Day. Um, Katie Day, I'm actually not even sure how I found this album in the first place. It may have been through this comedian called James A. Caster, um, who is a huge proponent of this album. He listened, he had this project where he listened to like 500 different albums from the year 2016, and this was his favorite one. So um, I feel like that's a pretty good authority to, um, to go off, wow. but it's a really, it's a wonderful and unique album. Um, I guess it's really hard to define in terms of the genre. I'm just going to look at the Bandcamp tags quickly to see how Katie defines it. Um, she has tagged it as pop electronic and experimental, which I feel like is accurate. It also has this kind of like a home recorded feel to it. I don't want to describe it as bedroom pop necessarily because that has particular genre connotations that I feel like this sort of surpasses or is not, it's not exactly accurate to call it that. Um, but it's definitely like, it's a home recorded album. It feels very handmade and carefully constructed and carefully edited together. Um, I was listening to an interview with her. She said that a lot of the um, construction of this album like took place in the editing phase, even though the songs were originally written on guitar um the album's called flood mm -hmm. network that's the that's the name of it and you can find it on her band camp um so i may just i might just introduce some of the uh i guess the conceptual things behind the album um i had to look up the term flood network because i had you know had no idea what it meant i still kind of have no idea what it means because i'm not good at computers <laughs> um but i think what i understand it to mean is that when you flood a network uh, in computer programming, it, it means that every incoming packet is sent to every outgoing line. So, uh, what I, or every outgoing link, I mean, so I guess it's like, if you have like a bunch of stuff all linked together in programming, you just send the same signal through every possible line. Um, and so this idea of like maximalism and kind of like exploring every possibility I found was really um, conceptually interesting when thinking about it in relation to the music. Um, so it's really, um, she also said in this same interview that she was listening to a lot of music at the time that she made this. So I find this, this idea of input versus output um, interesting too when you are thinking about influence. So um, obviously what you listen to is going to determine what you put out into the world and the way that you compose. Mm. But what I found particularly cool was that when she talked about the fact that she was listening to heaps of music, she said it inspired her to try to make stuff that didn't sound like anything that she was listening to. Um, so she comes up with these really unique and interesting, um, I've said the word interesting so many times, but she comes up with these really unique ways of finding the cracks in the convention. Um, this album is so freaking interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I can't stop thinking of the word interesting. Yeah. It's a, uh, yeah, I, I really, I, I think you've done such a good job picking this one. I've enjoyed it so much. Um, tell me more about who is this guy who'd listened to 500 albums? Um, so James A. Caster is, he's just a comedian. Um, yeah. funny, funny dude. Uh, he also has a background as a musician playing bands and stuff. 
Um, and yeah, he had this project where he listened to as many albums as he could in 2016. And he, he wrote a book about it. Yeah. Is, is, is he Australian? No, he's a British English. comedian. Yeah. 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 Right. With, uh, That's with so Jim. cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah, anyway, um, how can I talk about this? Uh, so what I wrote about this album is that it, it feels like every possible avenue is explored. And um, there's also a lot of cases within the album of like one idea being explored in multiple different ways on um, so this idea of taking a small thing and then just like expanding it in every possible way, transforming it in every possible way, um, I find really interesting. It's so interesting. <laughs> I think, hey, oh, there we go again. Interesting. So freaking, yeah, that's, it's just the word. It must be the word of this album. Yeah. Maybe it's the word of our pod. We don't yeah. know yet. Um, <laughs> I, when I, when I first opened up this, um, band camp, uh, when I first opened up Katie's album and had a look, I saw, um, I just noticed that there were 17 songs and a lot of them go for, you know, between like, w you know, one and a half minutes to three minutes. Yeah. And I was sort of like as as a person who's generally not into short songs i um I, I was a little bit worried but then the minute i hit play i realized that this in this entire album is kind of just one big song exactly yeah it's it's like the way that the the way that the songs run into each other the way that they um the way that they are constructed yeah it's just like you were saying every possible avenue it's it's just this fantastic yeah, I mean, it's, this could almost be released as a single song, yeah. but I think it's, I think it's good. I think it's very, it's, it's. I think it's a better way to do things nowadays to release small, like smaller tracks and yeah. And also, it's probably a good way to um, it's a good way to tell a story because then you get to have all these different track titles and yeah, yeah. yeah so the I'm not really... the way it's it's structured, um, there are songs that have actual titles, um, so actual words like all, fleas, frailty, a lot of the songs begin with the letter F. Um, and then there are these instrumental interludes which are named after computer keys, so like F1, F2, F3, F4, um, that uh -huh. are, you know, it goes like a track and then there'll be an instrumental interlude. Now some of these instrumental interludes, like maybe they might have been written as like an instrumental outro to the track, but um, I really like that the way it sequences, it separates everything um, while everything still just runs into each other, um, it's very much a track where the sequencing of the album is super important. Um, and yet, like you said, it feels like one long song. Um, and mm. then maybe there are a couple of like, maybe a couple of larger sections, I guess you could say. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's definitely approached in that way as like this holistic work of an, it's definitely like an album. It's not just, uh, it's not a collection of songs. It's something where, the parts add up some add up to something that is um what am i trying to say the the whole adds up to something greater than the sum of the parts um mm. not that the parts aren't fantastic as well okay no they are fantastic parts. yeah i'll probably sound a bit hyperbolic but i do yeah i just really really like it and it's it uh kind of boggles me how it was made or i just can't understand how it was made but i'm going to try to get to the bottom of it as much as i can can <laughs> there's definitely an in, an ineffable quality about some of the composition here that feels mm. like even if you knew every technique that she was using you would never be able to replicate it um yeah and maybe she wouldn't even be able to replicate it i mean it was made a few years ago in the same interview that i listened to she said that it feels like it was almost made by a different person because she doesn't like remember mm. certain things or like yeah it's it's um yeah, I'm just going to get into it. So um, so I'm going to play probably one of the more traditional songs on the album. This is called Fear Over the Light. Oh, 
there's one part of this song that I wanted to draw particular attention to. Um, oh, actually, I'll talk about the song in general. So mm. um, one thing that it does, there are a couple of like cool um, things that she does here. She uses three bar phrases in the verse, um, which is like, it's a really um, easy technique to implement. You just shorten your phrase by one bar. Mm. Generally, we're used to hearing four bar phrases. And it creates this yeah. kind of cyclical feeling of like... Um, of like you're stuck in a loop or something. Uh, it's hard to explain mm. the feeling of it, but it feels irregular yeah. in a way that you can't quite place. Yeah, and 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 it gives it gives a lot of momentum to the song as well. Yeah, um, I, I I really like that. I think it's like is it like a, a three yeah three bar phrase like twelve twelve beats or something. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like it makes me think about what we talked about in the previous episode with, um, melody melody driven songwriting 100 so so it's like katie has discovered this really great chorus hook yeah and um and i just i just love the idea that as a songwriter you find that hook and then you find where you want it to end and then you just make that the the part you repeat like it's just such a it's such a simple idea and um i think there's a lot of songs in the world that could be made a lot better if people just you know <laughs> yeah we're People willing to break you. from the four bar phrase that feel Absolutely. which feels so natural to us to write things in four mm. bar phrases it's almost like yeah this internal rhythm that we have as humans but you know, i don't know like mm. it may be historically dictated by um like the classical period um when yeah. you know everything had to be you know, even numbered phrases and it has to be it has to be a balanced phrase you have to have yeah like the opening statement and the closing statement or whatever, right? This idea yeah. of symmetry that's established by Western classical music. Um, yeah. But, and it's so, so pervasive. Yeah, totally. Um, I, I, th I think if, if I think of my favorite example of this sort of writing, not to divert too much, yeah. um, but I think about uh, Say a Prayer, the Burt Bacharach tune. Yeah, I don't know. It. You know, say a little prayer. Oh, yeah, I do know. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it goes like, forever and ever. Oh, give me a heart and I will love you forever. It's like two bars of four and one bar of three. Yeah. And no one would ever know. No. Unless you think about it. And I mean, obviously, I think the most the most uh, talked about one is probably Hey Ya. Yeah. That's another song that really breaks from that tradition. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I think it's in like, yeah. it's got a bar of six, four or something um, in addition yeah. to the bars of four, four. So yeah, just following the yeah. melody with following the melody with your rhythm rhythmic ideas is a really great compositional technique. Yeah. Um, then one thing she does in the chorus is she kind of like um, has this like ascending melody. <laughs> and it goes back to the tonic the first two times that she does it, um, and then on the, the third time she does it, you have this like interrupted cadence where we go into the relative minor for a second. Mm -hmm. um to the e minor and she uses this sort of chord progression a lot um like tonicization of the relative minor or just in interrupted cadence into mm -hmm. um chord six but the way i like to think about it is like you know in general harmony you have keys right so we have the key of g major which has the same notes as e minor so going back to this idea of a flood network, exploring all the possible options, it's like she's exploring, you know, the two main possible options for this combination of notes. Um, so I mm. like that she kind of plays with the major and minor. Um, yeah, so I like the idea that she is experimenting with exploring all the possible options for this group of notes. So you've got the minor key that uses this same exact group of notes and you have the major key that uses this exact same group of notes. Um, and it's really mm. fun to play with that yeah uh, so one thing in particular i wanted to talk about is a really uh a really important motive gets introduced halfway through this song but a really cool thing is she really doesn't draw attention to it it's kind of in the background which is this motive it happens about the one minute mark um so it's like a descending stepwise motive if we wanted to break it down further we would say that the motive mm -hmm. is just the first four notes and then the second four notes are an inversion of that motive, so it's just flipped. And starting on the major seventh, ascending upwards. Mm. Um, okay, so then I want to play you another song because the very next track, it really expands upon this motive and changes it and stuff. Yeah. So like it adds a fourth above it. Okay. 
Um, but the fourth is sticking to the, um, the major scale. So it creates this kind of like, it actually changes the interval relationships. You just put it a fourth up, which is, it's not like a, a perfect fourth every time. Yeah. One of them is an augmented fourth. Yeah. Anyway, let's listen to the next track. So, so yeah. does, sorry, d d does she just keep it parallel the whole time? She keeps like it parallel. Like fourths or yeah. does she? Yeah, cool. Yeah, and one of them is just becomes an augmented fourth by virtue of her keeping it in the same key. Yeah. Um, because there's that augmented fourth that occurs between the fourth degree and the seventh degree of the major scale. Cool. Um, so I'm going to play the, the next track, which is called F5. So it's one of these instrumental interludes. <laughs> technically three tracks. I played the end of Fear of the Light into the instrumental F5 into So You Pick Yourself Up. Because really, it's all the, this one musical idea that connects these three different songs. So you have the, the motive that has been introduced in the middle of Fear of the Light. Which then uh, has a fourth added to it at the end of that same song. And then in the instrumental F5, um, she samples that song, um, but it's short and slightly, so it almost feels like a bar of seven. So it's like, dum, 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 dum. Oh, it's dum, oh, that's... dum, dum, yeah. dum, 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 dum. Oh, that's, that's so funny because I heard that line and I was like, oh, this is 11. Yeah. But I think it's just because I was dividing it differently. I was, I was hearing like, like dum t dum t dum t dum t dum t You know, I think you're right. It's probably like a slightly more accurate um, way of dividing mm. it um, in terms of the actual length of the sample. Um, but 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 the the interesting thing though is that it kind of re repeats like that for a while and then slowly smooths out and then becomes something else exactly, entirely. Exactly. Yeah. So, so it's got like it's, it descends in pitch as well over the course of that F five instrumental. It has this kind of 
very gradual like pitch bend downwards it just keeps going down further and further until it's um in the key of the next track essentially mm. also the upper part gets kind of foregrounded so instead of hearing which we heard in Fear of the Light, that was like the main melody, the upper harmony feels more foregrounded here. So that when the next track starts with, it feels like this really, really logical progression from one thing to the next. It's such a smooth progression and such a great example of motivic development um, within a pop song. And it's just, yeah. So such an excellent transition from one thing to the next, from one idea to the next. Mm. Um, one other cool and thing that she does is in this next song, which is so you pick yourself up. Um, so she's in three, four now, like, um, and she still has the actual motive from the previous track going on in the background. just faintly in the background at the same time. So it's all these layers mm. of the same idea, but transformed in different ways. Yeah. And, and I mean, I got to, um, I got to talk about the production as well, because the production serves it quite well in terms of, um, I think even what you were saying with how the, that part from the initial song goes back into the background and the other part moves into the foreground. Yeah. It's sort of, um, yeah sort of i don't know a better way to make that point it's just cool production just, yeah the whole thing is really well produced um i guess when we talk about modern music uh, a bit a big thing is the way that things are produced and mixed and everything it's like whereas before composers were um you write the you know the notation and the rhythms and the melodies of what you want the performance to play it, now it's a more holistic thing where um you have to think about the sound of the track or the, the tone color of a song is really, really important. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really cool how, yeah, she kind of moves that idea into I, the I, background of the song and then foregrounds the new yeah. version of the mood. I, I really like, um, in fear, fear or the light, the, the, the way the guitar sound is just so nice. It's like a, it's like a really like a warm bath for your ears. Yeah. It's just this really, it's, it's so pleasant. I could just sort of dwell in that space yeah. forever. It's so nice. It kind of makes me think about, I guess, some of like neutral milk hotels, acoustic guitar production. Yeah. There's um, this kind of fuzziness I, to it. That's really, really yeah. nice to listen to. And it's an, another yeah, super I, impressive thing about this album is the variety of the production. Like, um, yeah. Like I feel like she could make like a perfect indie rock album if she wanted to. Um, yeah. But then she goes in all these different more experimental avenues. But part of me is kind of interested to, to, you know, in, in what that would sound like if Katie was to, you know, have thousands upon thousands of dollars to spend on producing a really polished yeah. album. But, um, but I also feel like maybe an album like this couldn't have happened in any other environment aside from home because yeah. there's just so much love put into every, every little detail. And yeah. 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 One thing that I found very challenging when I, uh, so for each episode we do a track and style of the person that we're talking about. And because her music is so detail oriented and you can tell that she's just spent hours kind of laboring over every little thing. I found it so challenging mm. to like try to emulate that, really handcrafted feel yeah. of of each song yeah um but yeah so this this motive i think it's yeah it's probably like my musical highlight from um from the album and it mm. actually reoccurs again later on um so i'm just gonna play when it reoccurs which is on the instrumental track yeah, please do f7 uh and then but, but yeah. before before you do i just i just want to point out the fe fear of the light is my favorite track and i'm so glad it's the track that you picked yeah. to deep dive oh, on that's great. yeah it's it's it's, it's such a and, and it's so good as well to have like i don't know a, a lot of a lot of bands tend to put like their big kind of pop songs at the beginning yeah. of an album and it's so good to have something like this right in the middle like it's yeah oh yeah, yeah it's it's so it is such a good song it's a great the, the cool thing like she's just really good like pop songwriter as well which is kind of what we've been saying 
um, yeah, mm. with these really experimental tendencies. Okay, I'm gonna play yeah. the track F7. Um, yeah, here we go. <laughs> that same melody again but it's once yeah. again transformed I, I didn't even recognize it until you pointed it out just then yeah. it's um you, you know what it reminded me of then a little bit and maybe it's because i've been listening to it recently but and you know what it might even be in the same key it reminded me of no surprises oh yeah da, da, da. No, no surprises. surprises. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's got a like the the melodic contour of it going down and then up. Yeah, uh, and then maybe the addition of the glockenspiel as well. I, I'm pretty sure there's glockenspiel and no surprises, maybe or something mm. like that. I, I, I um, when I was listening to this, this, this that song just then, it reminded me. Um, have you heard of a genre called death dream? No, I haven't. Okay, so. It's one of those things where I'm not quite sure if it's a real genre or if it's just something that a video essay person on YouTube made up. Um, it's, it's basically like, it's, it's music about, uh, in, in, in a nutshell, it's music about um, kind of post-apocalyptic worlds and the breakdown of society and c computers live on. Like it's kind of, um, it's very dark music. And it reminded me the the drums on uh, Katie's album and the way they kind of are broken up and um, kind of pushed to their limit, overdriven, distorted, yeah, all the like. It really reminded me of Death Dream music, and in particular, an album called Geolocationism by Reef Frequent. um it's it's a very interesting aesthetic and i would recommend the youtube video yeah. and i and i think i think the comparison is um yeah i think it's pretty easy to see see how similar they are yeah i guess this idea of these like extremes and things being pushed to the limit i feel like it once again goes mm. back to this flood network idea of like flooding like yeah. the the frequency spectrum right with all these like really high sounds these really low sounds there are yeah. all these like non-pitched elements and lots of these tracks, like this white noise elements, white noise, again, like the, the technical, like definition of white noise is every frequency being played at the same time. Like that's what creates mm. that sound. So I feel like all of this stuff is like really conceptually relevant. Um, but just yeah. in terms of the, the composition on that track, um, what I really like is that, um, it, it's like, da, 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 da. but then the bass is in like a different, time signature, creating this uh, three against two hemiola, like, um, ah, sorry. Uh, I can't do it, but don't, yeah, it creates this three against two hemiola is, with is the it, bass. Is it like a, like a, that's exactly it. Yeah. Yeah. So then like that, that's one hemiola or polyrhythm or polymeter, whatever you want to call it. 
occurring. Um, mm. And then the drums are in four when they're introduced. They just jump, 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 yeah. yeah. I was trying to figure out their relationship. Yeah. So that that's what it is. That's so interesting. Yeah. So you have like these kind of these three different uh, time signatures occurring at the same time. Um, so it's really yeah. like a really fun little uh, rhythmic approach. Um, cool. So I mean that's mostly what I wanted to talk about. I, it, it's worth listening to the entire album. I think it's so great. Obviously, um, I guess like the other thing I would talk about is um, there are like all these ideas that uh, to do with like the number four. Like the, a lot of the harmony mm -hmm. is in fourths. You have this four note uh, motive that gets repeated. Um, oh. and I just feel like there's something there with that, but that's just kind of this number that kept kind of sticking out to me. Wow. Um, I, I wonder, I wonder how intentioned that is. I, I, I love when stuff like that pops up, but I, I do always wonder is, is it like, yeah, uh, yeah. I fully, I don't know if it's mm. uh, intentional or not, but that was one thing that stuck out to me. A couple of other things that I'll just quickly go through. Um, I think the the fact that, um, it's a very like digital sounding album, but it's kind of focusing on the imperfections of like digital recording maybe, or like digital manipulation, like maybe using effects that aren't intended for that particular purpose to create this kind of glitchy or otherworldly sound. Uh, that's one mm. thing I really liked. And then the other thing, so just going back to this idea of like exploring every possibility, there's a lot of kind of non quantized elements. So like nothing is yes. really snapped to grid. So it's like, well, okay, we have these like rhythmic possibilities, but if you actually, you know, take away the click track or whatever, um, then there's actually like hundreds more possibilities. Um, so and it has a very human feel to have things yeah, less quantized. It's it, it brings to mind, it's like, is, is Katie like doing tempo automation on Ableton or something? Or is she just clicking take off the grid and just YOLOing it? I don't like know. I, a... I feel like it's loop based, but non quantized. Um, so, like, yeah. she, maybe she'll generate a loop and then um, play off that loop and not worry about that. Mm. I never, it's, it all I, fits I, together once. Yeah. I, I feel like, I feel like that's, that's like the future. Yeah. I, I kind of like in, in like a broader, sorry, I have my friends throwing rocks at the window. I live above some of my friends and they're outside. Go away. Don't, don't they know we're um, recording a podcast? Don't, don't they know that we're recording the second episode of Music Rules yeah, podcast? Yeah, this is not Music Rocks. Um, this is Music Rules. This is, ah, that's, that's so good. Now we've got to keep that joke in. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, wow, it's really hard to think. Yeah, now. it's hard uh, to, um, what? We're talking about non-quantized loops. The, the kind of human feel, um, I think, is essential. Yeah. Yeah, the, the sort of human side. I'm just going to send a message to these guys and just say, stop throwing f***ing rocks at my window. Yeah, okay, fair enough. <laughs> I am recording a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um... <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh ridiculous they're really going for it yeah i can hear it it's uh, loud um yeah yeah I, i'm such a I fan am recording of aleatoric techniques and by that i mean using like chance or like human error or human decision to create a level of complexity because like we can write you know all the 15 and 4 bars mm. that we want but um at the end of the day nothing will be more complex than for example, someone playing drums for the first time and like yeah. just playing it really uh, imperfectly, but consistently imperfect. Um, yeah. It's like the most complicated mm. thing in the world to try to replicate that. Like there's just something about oh, it's, chance and imperfection yeah. that creates huge levels of complexity. I, I don't know if you've ever, ever had this experience as a teacher, but um, one time I was teaching uh, this group of young boys. I think they're like about 10 years old. And um, their bass player, it was like, I was running a like group bands, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, just like a, a rock setting as like drummer, guitarist, their basses didn't show up. So I was like, oh, I'll play some bass. And then um, we started doing um, one of their songs and I was counting the meter with them and like doing it in time. And then um, we, we had like a break where the music stops and then the pulse keeps going and then we come back in and I was feeling it in what I thought was the correct pulse, but then I came in way earlier than everyone else. <laughs> and they all just kind of look at me like, like, no, that's not how it's like this. Like it, it might not be technically correct, 
Because I'd like to think I was keeping a, a very solid rhythm, but these guys just have a completely different They're in a different kind of wavelength, feel. yeah. They're in a different <laughs> wavelength. I just remembered what I was going to say before my friend started throwing rocks at the window. I think, um, I think, like, and this is like a larger kind of prediction about music. I think that uh, unquantized music is going to become the next sort of big, uh, the, the next thing that people do more. Yeah. I, I feel like, I feel like maybe as like AI, um, AI becomes more, uh, more intelligent and more like better at kind of replicating what humans do. Yeah. I think we're going to be yearning for this authenticity. Exactly. Yeah. And I, I think, um, I think that unquantized music is going to be, yeah, going to, going to be the next yeah, big thing. Yeah. Like the human element of things is often what makes them interesting. Like just something that a computer could never replicate if it never tried, you know, a thousand times. Yeah. Um, which yeah. is, yeah, there's a lot of stuff like that on this album, even though it is so digital and it is kind of informed by, you know, computers and the internet and all of these things, right? It's so human as well. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, that's a great point. I might just, uh, I might show you the song that I wrote that. Yeah. It, Is it that time? I'm so keen to hear it. Yeah. Um, so I actually, well, you'll see what happens, but I took that motive that, um, we were talking about and I stole it, um, for at least the opening of the song, but. Anyway, I will play it to you, and you will see.
Um, woo! <laughs> I hope I didn't pick my mic for doing that woo. Okay, no, it's fine. That was great. Thank you. Nice work. Thanks. Yeah, I think um I think while I was listening to that, I was like, um, made made me think about how when we're doing these songs, we're like uh we 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 are sort of paying homage to these artists, but a lot of our own playing and compositional ideas comes through. Yeah. Because that was very much yeah, that was just as much uh Fen as it was Katie, I reckon. Yeah. Um, I, I, I took some notes. Do you want to hear them? Yeah, sure. Sweet. So I thought the strings in the beginning were super cool. It reminded me, are you very familiar with Aphex Twin? Oh yeah. Um, sort of. <laughs> yeah. Do you know the song girl boy song? No. Nah. It's, it's like this, um, it's like a break core song, like probably when he was at his most Actually, I don't know anything about Aphex Twins eras, so I'm just going to stop right there. But uh, it's 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 a really kind of jungly breakcore song with this like really beautiful, pretty string samples over the top yeah, nice. in in a major key. Very pretty. It reminded me of that that specific sample. Was this all made in Garage Band? Yeah, yeah, all Garage Band. What, 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 yeah, what, was was that Garage Band strings? Um, at the beginning, I think it's Garage Band Hall. Um, oh, that was hard. Yeah, yeah, just like a midi hard. Okay. Song. Yeah, one yeah, thing cool. that was fun to do, or that I, that I do anyway, but um, was fun to explore, was using like the orchestral sounds on GarageBand. So like the weird like rrr, 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 mm. that was like an oboe, but pitched down. Yeah. And with like yeah, I, I changed the form, and so just like using <laughs> things for not their intended purpose. Uh, yeah, that that um, yeah. I I made a note about that specific sound because I was like, what is that? So that was an oboe pitch down. Yeah, and I changed. And you can there's an effect called vocal transformer, designed for vocals. Mm. And you, if you change the formant of, I don't even know what it means, formant, but um, just makes the sound sound darker or something. So it's like this mm. dark sounding oboe. Yeah, um, right. Yeah, yeah. It, it it almost sounded like I've got this uh this VST called Koji. Yeah, and it's it's like a it's like, it's like based off like the um the what's it Su super nintendo like sound chip oh cool and it's got a it's got a sound called more voice which i'll i'll send to you and you can oh, yeah. put in do. after i say more <laughs> more voice um and it kind of, it kind of sounded a bit like that it's very like cutesy yeah cutesy nice um what's the word like uh yeah a bit nostalgic yeah I also I I wrote that um it's cool how the drums slowly faded out. Um I thought the room piano sound was really cool. Um it sounded like it, the piano was like the it was recorded with a mic sitting like pretty far in the room. Yeah. With the piano. Yeah, yeah. Was was that like was that like at like a teaching studio or yeah, something? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly where it was. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> cool. <know> <laughs> Yeah, I know the one. Yeah, I put the mic um, on top of the piano, but the, the actual microphone is facing away from the piano, um, so uh, create that kind of distant uh, white yeah. noise kind of feel. Yeah, I thought the the glitched audio clipping stuff you were doing was really cool. And following on from that, I really liked how the vocals at the end didn't have the attack; it just came straight in from yeah where where the note was. Yeah. Um, if if you're unfamiliar with what attack is, dear listener. Um, when, when you hear an, an, like a sound or like a sound wave, there's like four elements to it, attack, uh, sustain, decay, release. I think I said them in the right order. And, uh, the, the attack is the first part of a sound. So if you, if you were to play like, a um, like, a or if you, if you were to sing a note, there's like, la, there's like a slow, la, from, from the moment that there's silence to the moment you hear a note. Yeah. That's that's the that's the attack. And the attack often so, like it often informs us what instrument is playing. So like if I play the piano, right. like it's very recognizable mm. as a piano. But if I do that and just fade the volume knob in, yeah, or like even a chord, uh, like that doesn't sound like a piano. Yeah. But then if yeah. I have the attack, it's clearly a piano. Um, yeah. So one thing I, but, I did as well was I used like uh, piano chords in sort of the second half of the song, like kind of like broad, broad. That's just piano chords, but then like, I just uh, faded in and out without including the attack. Oh, cool. Um, so it makes it sound yeah, nice. like kind of like this neutral uh, tone color. 
Um, yeah. I'll just talk about what, like, one of the sort of the compositional ideas or the thought processes I had and how I was trying to adapt yeah, the, please. Uh, her work. So obviously I'm using the same motive that she developed in her album. Uh, so that's just like a, you know, quotation. Um, then I really wanted to explore this idea of trans transformation because I feel like it's such an important idea in the context of her album, like everything, like these ideas just transform and shape shift into these paths that you don't expect. Um, so I really want to have, like have it go through all these like different, um, you know, styles or whatever. Um, like it gets a bit dancey for a second, then it's just the piano by itself, but it's all kind of based off the, the same idea. So just showing like how you can really, um, use one idea and just really transform it to create something that sounds really varied, which is what she does so well in her original. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was trying to pick pick apart some of the polyrhythms that you had in. Um, I think what was it kind of the same, like a three over two thing. Um, but, actually, yeah, I I really I didn't think about it too much. I mean, that's why it's harder it, to pick apart. It kind, yeah, because cause it kind of got um, yeah, it got like I was like, oh yeah, I can follow this rhythm, and then it became something completely different, and I was like, huh, you know what? He's probably doing the unquantized thing. It was that we yeah, were just talking it was definitely about. that. It was very much loop based. I was working a lot. Uh, so in GarageBand, I didn't have it set to like beats per minute. I was just looking at the time. Um, yeah. so it wasn't really like lining stuff up based on the bar. It was more just like recording a loop, making things the same length and just looping that. And then just going from there and just using my internal rhythm to make things in time or hmm. roughly in time at least. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think, I think that's a great way to do it. Yeah. I haven't really worked like that before, so. Definitely was inspired mm. by listening to this album, at least. Yes. Yeah. As, as we speak, I can I can feel the grid slipping away. Yeah. The, I feel like I feel like it's grid, uh, the grid that controls the, the our mind minds, grid, the mind prison, yeah, the matrix, the, the mind the matrix, the prison of rhythm, the prison of rhythm. You know, it's it's a thing. It's a thing that's it's far more flexible than people realize. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Well, yeah. I feel like that's probably cool. a good place to leave it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I I just I, I sort of just want to plug Katie for oh, a second 100%. because I I was on her um band camp and I noticed she's got a Patreon. Yeah. And it's not much, two bucks a month, and you can support an awesome artist and help her pay rent and live a good life so she can continue focusing on what she's excuse my French <laughs> fantastic at, which is making sick albums. Yeah. So you can also download her most recent release, which is called the Kraken. Um, uh, I yes. listened to that. I listened to the Kraken. It was yeah, really, it's, good. it's really good. It's her yeah. style has really transformed, um, since flood network. So mm. it's definitely worth uh, listening to all of her more recent stuff and buying mm. it. it up. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like, it's a, it's slightly more, um, more restrained or more subtle. Yeah. Um, I agree. More subtle writing. Yeah. Um, one one thing I also noticed just while I remember is I think the mix of Flood Network on Bandcamp is different to the one on streaming services. Uh -huh. Interesting. So if if you want Flood Network that is like quite like loud and quite um quite in your face, then go onto Bandcamp. And if you want if you're more a fan of sort of a bit more um restrained, I guess, then you can go on to Spotify. Personally, I've been blasting the Bandcamp one because it's um, it's just great. It's I, I like to listen to it really loudly. Yeah, so. right. Yeah, I've been mostly listening on Spotify, but I'm gonna I'm gonna check out the Bandcamp version. Interesting. We, we, we've had two two slightly different musical experiences. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All righty, cool. Yeah, so definitely support her by her music on Bandcamp. Uh, sign up to the Patreon if you would like to do that, and um, yeah. I mean, you should also buy Jack's album, uh, Basil's Kite, Shooting Sars, available now on Dark Trail Records. Thank you so um, much for the lovely plug, my friend. Yes, I think what, when this comes out, we'll still be touring probably April. Um, yeah, come and see us if you live in Newcastle and or Canberra. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. Thanks so much for listening, guys. See ya. Music rules. Music freaking rules. Bye.